she asked me, she said, have you lost any, did, did, did your water break? I'm like, no, my water did not break. Have you been, uh, has your body been leaking? I'm like, no, not that I have noticed. And I was so confused because now I'm like, what, what did I miss? And how did I miss that? You know, she was like, because when the fluid is not there, the movement gets restricted and, you know, everything else gets affected. I, I, I was just, I was so confused. And she said, well, um, this baby needs to come out today. It was Christmas of 2019. I remember this so well because it was a hot day as is typical of most Christmas days in Kenya or in Nairobi. Um, it seemed like a regular day. We had the usual activities for the day planned with family and all of that and I was ready for it. But something just felt a little off with my body. So I remember being... Um, at my, with my parents uh, in law, we'd gone over for Christmas because we usually have Christmas dinner together. And it was, it was a great day. We exchanged gifts and do all of that, all of those fun things. But I remember just being so cold, like I was freezing cold. And I kept wondering why the sun was blazing hot. Everybody kept saying how hot it is. Oh, what a hot day, it's such a hot December but I was very, very cold. So I had a sweater on and I think I remember somebody asking me, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm just a little chilly. But then I got really, really cold. And um, my mother-in-law said, she said, daughter, are you okay? And I said, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really, really cold. So I remember her giving me one of her shawls. It was a big, bright red shawl. And, you know, I felt okay, now I'm good. I can get through the day. I was bundled up. So just imagine the irony of that, that it's blazing hot, but here's a girl fully bundled up, a sweater, a shawl, and still feeling a level of um, chills in her body. So I just thought I must be coming down with something, but I didn't pay too much attention to it. So a few days after Christmas, my husband and I went out of town um, just to kind of relax and unwind. And during this getaway, because I love to travel, I love to just get away and um, take in the spaces wherever we go. Uh, there was, uh, we were supposed to go on game drives and all I wanted to do was sleep, okay? So I remember this one day my husband had gone out. He, he decided to go take some pictures of, I think there were flamingos or whatever. He decided to step out for a few minutes um, to take some pictures. And I literally just got into the deepest sleep you can imagine. It was such beautiful sleep. And he comes back and he's like, you're fast asleep. And it was broad daylight, okay? And these things, it just seemed to happen more and more. Every time I just sat down, you know, which was a lot, I'd be like, okay, I just need to relax a little bit. I would fall asleep almost immediately. Uh, I remember this one evening, we tried to watch something, I think a, a series or a movie or something. And um, I had my cup of tea and I just sat. And the next thing I knew was what woke me up was that I had spilled the tea on myself because I fell asleep and the cup that I was holding completely spilled all over me. And my husband is like, what's going on with you? And I, and I said, I don't know. I don't know why I'm so fatigued. I'm so exhausted. And I couldn't place my finger on it. And I kept saying, you know, I've had such a long year. Knew, you know, it happens when you've had back to back things to do and then you finally stop and your body's just like, yes, it's time to rest. So I figured that's what was, was going on. Um, but I made a mental note that when we got back home, I'd still go and just possibly have myself checked to make sure that everything, uh, that nothing was wrong with me. So we get back and um, I remember we got home on a Saturday, on Sunday, I had to show up at work. At the time I was, I was hosting a Sunday morning show. Um, so I go to work and it was because our mornings were very early. I used to wake up, I'd be up by about three o'clock, four o'clock, get ready uh, so that by half past five, I was already at the studio. So 
I had gotten into the routine of it because I had done this for over a decade, but this Sunday was just very difficult. But then I said, you know, I have been very tired, so um, understandably so. So I go do my show and then I went home because I was just looking forward to taking a nap, okay? So I get home and um, I take a nap. And then when I woke up about maybe an hour after, it was almost like an epiphany. It was like a moment where I was like, wait a minute, could it be? Is there even the slightest chance that I could be pregnant? And you know, um, for all of you who've been on the TTC journey, trying to conceive, you know that one of the things that um, we always do is go to Dr. Google. So I was quickly on Google. What are the symptoms of early pregnancy? And of course, Google will tell you all sorts of things. And even when you're not pregnant, you will think you're pregnant because your symptoms will show up. So, you know, it was um, getting tired and sleepy. And, and I said, this is definitely the symptoms that I have been experiencing. So I think it's time for me to take a test. Now, remember that it had been um, I had gone to that place after I got I had gotten the doctor's report where I, I, I decided, OK, this is what it is. Um, I cannot get pregnant without uh, assisted reproduction. So I'm just going to relax, enjoy life. Um, and I was really at a good place. I was finding my joy back. I was just finding my um, my reason for living. I was back to that place where I accepted and I truly believed that. My being here is bigger than being a mother. So anyway, I went into my uh, drawers and pulled out because I had over time collected a lot of pregnancy kits. So I took out two of them and I went to the bathroom. It was very casual because I knew it's, it's not gonna be, but let me just check that box so that by the time I go see a doctor, um, I can already say in case they ask me because they will, probably do a routine check. Are you pregnant? No. Have you tested? No. So then they will test. So I decided, let me just do it and get it out of the way. So I took this pregnancy test and I kid you not, like literally, because I think it takes about three minutes, depending on the test, before I could even like the time I could get to a minute, there was the darkest two lines on that pregnancy test. And I thought, oh my gosh, I think I, there must be something wrong with this test. So I'm reading the instructions again. What do two lines mean? Is, do two lines mean pregnant or not pregnant? Um, so I said, no, this, this test must be faulty. So let me just take another one in case. So I took another one and this one was even faster than the first one. It was a completely different um, type of pregnancy kit. So it came out positive. And I remember because the first time that I got a pregnancy, a positive pregnancy test, the time when I had the miscarriage, I had been so excited. This time was so different. It felt almost like shock. I felt shocked. So I remember sitting on the bathroom floor and just wondering what it meant, wondering if I was allowed to hope or allowed to be joyful, um, thinking through what the doctor had said and feeling as though this was not supposed to happen like this. So I'm not sure if everything is going to be okay with this pregnancy. So it was just such a confusing feeling. But then I put everything aside and I decided the next best thing that I'm going to do is take another nap. <laughs> so I went to the living room, I put something on the TV and I fell asleep on the couch. Now, I remember it was a Sunday, so my husband was out at church, um, but he came back. And when he came, I had put a little note on the bed together with the pregnancy test, just to let him know, because I didn't know how to actually say it. So I wrote a little a cute note and I put it on the bed with the positive test. And I remember him coming to the living room and he sat just next to me and he said, is this what I think it is? And I said, yeah. And just like me, 
his response or his reaction was very different from the first time because the first time he was very overwhelmed, overjoyed. I remember him kneeling down to, to thank God for the miracle. And this time he was like, I hope you know I'm actually happy, but I don't know how to respond to this because what happens is when you have had so much hope for something and then it's suddenly taken away from you, when it comes again, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to respond. I remember a few months after, um, a few weeks after I had had the miscarriage, I remember traveling to go and visit my mom at the time was living um, outside the country. So I, I traveled, I needed to see her, um, and, you know, and she said, Kambo, I think this will do you some good. Just come out, let's, let's spend some time. So I traveled and I was with her for a few weeks and it was so good for my heart because my mom has just had a way with my heart over the years. But I remember the day that I was preparing to come back to Kenya. My mom, because she will always take time to pray before we leave, whether you're traveling or you're going back to your house or whatever, she'd be like, okay, let's pray. So she did what she would ordinarily do. She said, okay, before we leave for the airport, let's, let's pray. So we sat down to pray and I remember my mom praying um, she was praying in Kikamba and she said, um, I'll say it in Kamba and I'll, and I'll tell you what it means. She said, um, The translation for that means, God, we thank you for the baby that you gave to us and he came back to you or the baby came back to you. But now God, we're praying that you will give us the one who will stay. And that prayer just had me undone completely. I remember just breaking down so much because she was able to put into words what I hadn't been able to put into words and to express myself in a way that I just, I couldn't because really what I wanted was not just to get pregnant, but to actually get pregnant and have a, a, a child or a baby who would stay, a pregnancy that would last, a baby that I could hold. So in this moment, fast forward, where we're now discovering that I'm pregnant again, I was making these prayers in my heart and saying, God, is this one going to stay? Is this the one who is going to stay? So the next day, which was a Monday, booked an appointment with my gyna and we went in and um, she says, okay, Kambua, uh, what brings you in? So remember when I last saw her, she had given me several options that I needed to, we needed to look into, to talk through and then decide where the journey was going to begin for us. So um, she probably assumed that I was now ready to tell her we want to try IVF or we want to try whatever, you know, whatever path was right for us at the point. So I sit there and I tell her, um, and I was still in, in a level of shock. And I said, I'm pregnant. And my doctor just, I remember her reaction. I remember how excited she was. I think she, she got the excitement that I couldn't have in that moment. And she said, Kambua, I told you, I told you that God, God does miracles. He does things that even we as doctors cannot do or cannot explain. And she's like, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. This is amazing. This is great news. So I think her joy began to be contagious a little bit. And I, I, I suddenly started feeling like it's okay for me to hope. It's okay for me to be joyful. I had already done the the home test, but of course now I had to do the blood work to confirm that the HCG levels were the way that, where they were supposed to be and that the pregnancy was actually viable. So I got my blood work taken. I went off to do my hair. It seems like I, I would always do my hair after <laughs> having my meetings with my gyna. It's always been a place for me to decompress. Um, and then I came back in the afternoon at the time that she told me to come back and she, she, I could just tell when I walked into her, in, into the room, um, into her office, I could just tell that she, she was happy, you know, and she said, Kambua, I'm looking at your results. I'm looking at the results that we, we had a few months ago and I'm looking at 
what, where your blood work is and what it's saying. And it's like two completely different people. It's unbelievable. And um, I said, oh my God, I am actually pregnant, like really, really pregnant and it's looking good. So it's okay for me to celebrate. It's okay for me to be happy about this. And so it began my pregnancy with my son, Nathaniel. And um, because we hadn't gotten very far along with the first pregnancy, then this was different. And every milestone meant something completely different. I'd had the loss at about eight, nine weeks. So when it got to about that place, I, I started to get a little anxious and it was really a battlefield of the mind where I had to keep speaking. I had to keep speaking the word. I had to speak, keep speaking life over the child that I was carrying. And I had to stay hopeful. I had to keep saying that that was the past. And this is something new that God is doing something new and the outcome of it doesn't have to be the same as it was the first time. But it was, a, it was a hard place to be mentally, you know? Um, and every little thing that I felt would make me wonder if something was going wrong. And uh, I had to really work on my emotions, my thoughts, and just getting myself in the right head space. Um, doing whatever it took to have my spirit right, you know, listening to worship music, music that spoke to me, just basically preparing myself to carry life and to carry it to term. My pregnancy with Nathaniel, I think, was very um, ordinary for the most part. I had cravings. I had um, aversions. I had a little bit of morning sickness. Some days it felt like all day sickness. But, there, you know, there are moments that stand out um, in pregnancy. I've heard men talk and I hope that they're listening. I've heard them talk sometimes and say that pregnancy cravings and morning sickness, it's all psychological. I want to tell you that it is not psychological. There's so much that goes on in a woman's body. Her hormones are changing at such a high rate that even we cannot fully grasp what is going on with us. Uh, I remember this one day we had gone for um, a friend of ours had passed on uh, a friend who is who was well known in the entertainment industry. So we were leading, I was part of the team that was leading worship at Nairobi Baptist Church. Now, my friends who were leading with me, if they're watching, will remember this day very well. So we went and we were leading worship. Now I had, I now knew that I was pregnant and I was a few weeks into, into it. I wasn't showing, but my body was really feeling very different. So as we were leading, you know, and we, after we finished leading worship and we were sitting in the church and the service is going on, I just got, I think this is the first time I had a really strong craving and I was craving githeri. I just, and suddenly it's almost like my nostrils, like I could just smell githeri and I just wanted githeri and I couldn't concentrate <laughs> anymore. And I thought, this is urgent. This is actually like an emergency, I need to get Gideri. So um, I remember telling my friends, I really have to go. I didn't explain where I was going because I don't, I don't know that anybody would have understood where I was going. So I said, I, I really have to go. And I excused myself. So I get into my car and I'm like driving through, you know, the Kilimani area, in the Halingam uh, area, and I'm like, where can I get good githeri? And then I remembered my friend, um, my friend DJ Mose. I remember when we used to work together, there was a, a little joint that he, <laughs> he used to call it Java B. It was somewhere near Kilimani where um, they would have all sorts of like Kenyaji food. And I was like, that joint must have githeri. So, I drive and I park my car and, you know, and I walked up to, you know, to the lady over there. And she, first of all, I, I think I just maybe looked very misplaced. I'm not sure, but I, I was on a mission. Okay. And she's like, Madam Nikusaidiaje. And I told her, Nataka Githeri. And she said, Sao, Nataka Ngapi. I was like, oh my gosh, she has Githeri. I was so happy. I said, I just need one. Um, so she packed me some good Githeri with some cabbage on the side. I was driving home and I'm like, I cannot wait to get home and eat, consume my githeri. 
I got home and um, I remember the Gideri having a little bit of weevils, weevils in the Gideri. But I was like, nothing will stand between me and my food. <laughs> so I quickly sifted. I removed the weevils <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> and I sat down and ate my Gideri. I felt so good. And then I took a nap. Okay. And um, I just remember later my husband going like, because he went to the kitchen and he saw what I had eaten. And he was like, are you okay? <laughs> and it just, it, it made me so aware of just what sometimes your body will do things that you're not, ordinarily you wouldn't do, but you're like, this, this is what I want right now. And, and it's important that I get it right now. So went through that, went through the cravings, went through the morning sickness. Um, at some point, my gyna, um, advice that we needed to get the McDonald's stitch uh, just to ensure that my cervix stayed closed all the way up until baby was born um, because for women who have had um, issues with their with their womb, with their uterus, with carrying a baby, then you know that if your cervix is compromised in some way, then it compromises the baby um, staying alive or staying in your womb. So uh, she basically just wanted to make sure that we are covered on all bases. So I was booked for this procedure. It was a day procedure. Um, it is a surgical procedure. So you go through the, the, the regular processes of uh, of surgery, fasting for a couple of hours. I was checked in early in the morning, went into the theater, got the stitch done. You know, I remember when I came to, I I could I could hear um, some of the nurses who were attending to me. I could hear them talking um, about me because sometimes the nurses don't even realize that you've actually, you're now conscious, even though you cannot move, that you can actually hear. And they had a little bit of a, of a conversation. And um, I remember it's moments like those where I felt so vulnerable and unable to, to speak for myself, unable to um, dignify myself. I wished that in moments like those, even if people know who you are or have an, a sense of what your story is, I wished that they would choose silence in those moments, but it is what it is. We moved on from there, went into the second trimester and I really now began to enjoy the pregnancy. I was feeling less sick, uh, less tired. I was now glowing. The bump was now coming on and so it was becoming like real, 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 real. Uh, my friends were getting me all of these cute maternity clothes. And of course at about five, almost six months is when I, you know, I was like, okay, I work on national television. I am there every Sunday. I cannot hide this pregnancy. And this is a conversation I, 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 I keep bringing up because a lot of people I have, heard it said to many women and it has been said to me on many occasions even in instances where I've experienced loss where I've been told you should never have announced your pregnancy and my question first of all was I am on your tv screen every single Sunday with a big baby bump whether I announce it or not you can see that I am pregnant um, so it wasn't an option that I had. I had to put that information out. Uh, I opted to have myself tell my story just like I am doing now, then have bloggers try to tell my story and not do it justice. So, um, and number two, this had been such a big thing that I had prayed for and I had gone through so much public humiliation that it wasn't, there wasn't anything to hide about it. And I figured that what God is doing in my life also ought to be a testimony to encourage other women that it is possible that God can actually change your story. And for me, this was God having opened my womb a second time, even though people didn't know about the first time, but I knew that God had done it a second time. And I wanted, I have been very intentional about bringing people along on my journey. So I made the announcement and it was, oh, it blew my mind. I, I, I knew that it would have 
some effect out there, but I, I remember posting it and then I logged off all my devices and yeah, probably took another nap, I don't know, but just disappeared from social media. And, um, and my phone was on fire. I wasn't picking it up. I wasn't looking at it. Um, and when I eventually did come back to the socials, I, was, I, I, I really was like overwhelmed at the response, at the joy, at the people saying, oh my goodness, my faith has been restored. If God can do this, he can do this for me. Uh, if he can do this for Kamboa, he can do this for me as well. And just friends from all over the world, reaching out, pouring out their love. It really, I felt lifted in the, in the moment. I felt so lifted. Um, and I kept telling my child, We're going to, we are going to make it to the end. So I finally got into my third trimester and um, the fatigue began to set in because obviously the baby was getting bigger, but I was so hopeful. Um, and I and still remained very confident that God would give me the grace to see the baby to the end. We had already at this point found out that we were having a boy, but to be honest, in as much as that excited me, it didn't matter to me whether I had a boy or a girl or twins or triplets or one, it didn't matter. It just mattered that I was pregnant and what I wanted was to have a healthy baby or to have a healthy babies. So, um, so I knew that we were having a son and um, I, had, I left it to my husband to decide on what to name the child. And I love the name that he picked, Nathaniel, because it means gift of God, um, because truly he is a gift of God. And um, I remember now at this point where you're, I'm nesting, I'm spending more time just resting. And the doctor kept saying, okay, rest. When you're tired, you rest, don't overexert yourself, don't lift heavy things. And just, you know, the, the things that you're told when you're pregnant. So I did everything that I could to take care of myself. My friends asked me about um, when I was going to start shopping and I just, see, I have always loved to shop. I have always found retail therapy very healing, therapeutic. But for some reason, the pregnancy also came with a not wanting to shop. I never wanted to be in the stores. I never, I just, I would think about it and I'd feel exhausted. So up until the, late into the third, or rather well into the third trimester, I was, I had not gone out to shop for my baby. And I kept saying, I will do it. I will do it. I will get round to it. I remember um, a friend of ours, a friend that I had grown up with. Um, we used to sing in the same group at Parklands Baptist Church, a group called Eneza. And I remember one of our members uh, in Eneza, her name was Gladys Mwangi, uh, passed on that year. And we went for, attended her funeral at Parklands Baptist Church. May she rest in peace. And first I remember trying to get to that service was so difficult for me that day. I just, my body, I felt a, 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 an extra level of fatigue. So I got to the service a little late I sat through the service and I was just so uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable. And um, somewhere towards the end, I decided, okay, um, I have paid my respects, let me go home. So I went home um, and then that, that day, that night, that evening, my husband was preparing dinner, I prepared a good meal and I remember saying, I remember I was more quiet than usual. And I said to him, I just feel like I haven't really felt the baby's movement today. I don't know if I haven't paid attention, but you know, in the third trimester, the movements are quite strong. You're able to know baby is kicking at this point, baby is moving, baby is sitting on my bladder. I just felt like he had been really, really quiet. When I thought about it, I was like, baby has been very quiet today. So uh, my husband was like, oh, let's do, you know, we've been told what to do when you feel like baby, you haven't felt baby's movement, you take a little bit of uh, something that has sugar. So he brought me some Ribena, I drank and I was like, no, nothing. 
He gave me an apple. I ate a little bit of it and I was like, nothing. And then the, other, the one thing my, my, my son would respond to in my room was music. So he brought uh, music, a little Bluetooth speaker, or was it his phone, but he brought it and placed it near the belly. And usually my son would immediately just begin to respond and there was like nothing. Um, so he says, okay. So I, I begin to pace up and down. I'm walking because I'm like, maybe I just need to exercise a little bit. So I'm walking up and down in the living room. Uh, it's about maybe eight going to 9 p.m. And of course, I've suddenly lost my appetite. I'm not eating because I just had this sinking feeling that something wasn't right. And then my husband says, do you think maybe we should go to the hospital? And I said, yeah, I think we should go to the hospital. So we quickly just, you know, I, I, I changed from my pajamas and we made our way to the hospital. So we got to the hospital and um, we explain, you know, he says, my wife, we're expecting a baby, but she says she hasn't felt any movement. Um, so they get me into one of those um, rooms. Uh, I don't know what, what are, they, are they emergency rooms, but you know, those rooms before you're taken to a ward, before you're admitted in the hospital where they can observe you, observation rooms. And the nurses who came, I want to cut them slack as I share this story. And this is a disclaimer that maybe it, it did seem to me that they might have been nurses in training because when I said that I hadn't felt any movement. They asked me a few questions. They brought in the, um, you know, just the, the handheld gadget that you're able to just take around. Not, not, not the, not the ultrasound that you use with the gel. Just the, that handheld one that you can just take around the belly. So she she brought it and she did. And she's looking for a heartbeat and she's looking and she cannot hear anything. And then they start, they're whispering to each other very loudly, if I may add. And she's like, one is like, Mrs. Ki Kitu, wanna scare Kitu, Mrs. Ki. And I, I, I was there like in shock because I'm like, do you realize that this is, you're talking about my baby and what you're saying, you, you're suggesting, you're suggesting something and just not having the, the courtesy to even step out of the room and have those whispers. Um, and I thought, I, my heart is going to stop right here, right here. If my baby's heart has stopped, mine is going to stop as well. And um, then she does it again, she does it again, and then she just drops the gadget and runs out of the room. And I was in shock. I didn't know how to feel. And then I'm looking at my husband because I'm now, I just want somebody who can tell me that it's going to be fine. And, you know, my husband in that moment... Uh, for some reason, in moments of deep, deep crisis, he has a way of staying very calm. And he would tell me, he said to me, it's okay. This baby is fine. He's just sleeping. They just haven't been able to find the position where he's, he, um, he's lying. The heartbeat is there. There's nothing wrong. I need you to relax. And we continue to pray. A few minutes after that, um, another doctor come, a doctor comes in. Those were nurses, a doctor comes in. And then my husband says, you know, my son likes to lie low on my wife's belly. I think if you put the gadget lower in this position, you'll be able to pick up a heartbeat. So the doctor was like, oh, okay. So she did. And then very faintly from like a distance, they caught the sound and she says, oh, there he is. And it's almost like I exhaled, you know, because I was like, okay, my baby's still here. But I think this, it, it was a very faint heartbeat. So um, they immediately things, a lot just begins to happen very, very fast. So somebody is bringing in forms for my husband to fill. They're like, you need to fill these forms. We're admitting your wife. So at some point my husband is like, wait, why are you admitting my wife? You're not even explaining anything to us. What is going on? And so this is when they tell us that um, we did pick up the heartbeat, but it's very faint. So baby, the baby could be in distress. We need to establish what is going on. Either way, your wife has to be admitted. So, I'm now taken in for an ultrasound. And um, when you go for this ultrasound that took 
very, very long. And as you know, I, you know, just having gone through that ultrasound, the one that um, told me that there was no heartbeat for my baby, I, I got anxious because I felt like I was just wondering why the ultrasound was taking so long. The sonographer was saying nothing. He had the most, the blankest look I have ever seen. I couldn't read his face. I kept looking at him. I couldn't read his face. His screen was turned away from me. And it's in those moments where you just, you're pleading. You're pleading for the life of your baby. You're pleading for your life. You're just, you're pleading for a miracle because there are no answers in sight. And um, eventually he finished and I asked him, we asked, is everything okay? And he says, as I guess his profession requires for him to do, he says, the doctor will explain the results to you. And I didn't know what to do with that. It almost felt like every everything someone said to me made my heart sink lower. Um, and I had to keep saying, what has God said? What, you know, what am I supposed to say in this moment? How am I supposed to speak life when I'm feeling like I'm already, um, I'm already getting, I'm getting defeated. How am I supposed to keep fighting? The doctor came back to us and finally explained the results. So um, she explained that there's, there has, there's usually a score. I think there are four things that they look at. Um, the baby's heart rate, I think out of two, the baby's movement out of two, your amniotic fluid out of two, and what was the fourth one? I cannot remember. But basically our scores were so bad my baby's heart rate was one out of two. My baby's movement was one out of two. My amniotic fluid was zero. And she asked me, she said, have you lost any, did, did, did your water break? I'm like, no, my water did not break. Have you been, uh, has your body been leaking? I'm like, no, not that I have noticed. And I was so confused because now I'm like, what, what did I miss? And how did I miss that? You know, it's just like, because when the fluid is not there, the movement gets restricted and, you know, everything else gets affected. I, I, I was just, I was so confused. And she said, well, um, this baby needs to come out today. I was 34 weeks. So in my head, I am like, this is not the time this baby was supposed to come. I was told 39 weeks or thereabouts. So we're still far. So what does it mean? Um, I was obviously in communication with my doctor. She had already spoken to the hospital. She was on her way. Uh, we were well into the morning now. I was now strapped onto these gadgets that just kept monitoring the baby's heart rate. So I could see, you know, on the side, it's, it looks like a graph that shows the heart rate. And um, it just, it seemed very peculiar because the graph instead of the graph going up, it was like the lines were like under, going under like this. The nurses would come in every few minutes and they were looking at it and they would look at it and it kept printing this paper. I did not know what was going on. But my doctor, she spoke to me and she, she said, Kambu, I'm on my way. Everything is going to be fine. We're going to deliver baby. And I need you to just relax and know that God is in control. So I relaxed, I felt reassured, even in that confusion, I decided I, I'm going to rest and I'm going to trust that everything is fine and that the people who are helping me actually are capable and know what they are doing. So when she came in, um, I don't know what time it was in the morning. I have no concept of time at this point. I remember her asking me, do you know what the, what these lines mean? I said, well, I know it's a baby's heart rate. She said, yes. So typically it should be, the lines should be going up, but this graph is mostly going down. Do you know what that means? And I said, I, do, I don't know what it means. And she basically said, we're, we're, this means that the heart rate, you know, it kept, it just kept dropping. It, it basically wasn't a good sign. Um, so it had to be an emergency evacuation, emergency C-section for my baby. So I never got uh, an option. I never got to, de to decide I want to have uh, a natural birth. I want to 
push this baby. I want, I never got to choose. It, it, it was chosen for me because the baby was in distress. And you know, I, I hear sometimes um, there's so much shaming, even among moms, we shame each other for, oh, you got a CS, so you got the easy way out. And it really bothers me because you don't know the circumstances under which women undergo C-sections. I've known women who have gone full time, have wanted to naturally give birth. They have labored for hours. Their babies have gone into distress and they've had to have an emergency C-section. Um, I know people who've elected, who've chosen to have a C-section. I also know having recovered from C-sections that they are so difficult and so hard on the body that I cannot wrap my head around somebody saying that that's the easy way out. I think that whether you labor and have your baby or you go for a C-section, I think that you are a strong and amazing mother. So I was quickly wheeled into the theater. Um, everything is a blur from there. I remember my uh, the guy who puts in the anesthesia, what is it called? I remember him. Um, I, I remember my doctor being there and I remember her praying. She prayed as, as, as she did, even when we did the McDonald's stitch, I remember her praying before they put me under. So I remember her even in this moment. And, um, and, and rem I remember her words, she said, come on, we have prayed. Now we're going to get moving. And then, um, the gentleman who had put in my anesthesia, the doctor, I remember him holding my hands and standing above my head and he kept talking to me through the procedure. And he, you know, we were, I think he, he, his work was to distract me and to just put my head in a place of calm. Uh, I don't remember, we weren't talking about uh, very important things, but he kept me talking and he kept me calm and he kept reassuring me. And, um, they, you know, they kept telling me, okay, you'll feel some pulling and tugging as we're getting the baby out. And I, I could hear all these things, but of course I cannot see what's going on. And then eventually I hear, okay, we've got baby is out. Uh, congratulations, Kambua, it's a baby boy. And what I have seen like in the movies or, you know, what I have heard people share with me is that when the baby comes, it's usually like a loud cry and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a, you know, it's a baby boy. But I heard the announcement and I didn't hear the cry. And I, I thought something is not fully the way it's supposed to be. So I'm still very confused. And um, I could hear conversations, you know, NICU, baby has to be, you know, they have to. And, but they explained to me, my doctor explained, we're just gonna take the baby to the NICU um, so that we can take care of him, but he's fine. I stayed there and I thought, I just kept thinking, okay, my baby's alive. I have been assured that my baby's alive. I did not hear him cry, but I believe that we are okay. I had never known, I'd never even thought that babies, when you have a baby, they could go to a NICU which is the neonatal ICU. I didn't know that it wasn't a possibility. It wasn't something that crossed my mind. Um, I just knew that you get a baby, they're, they're put on your uh, on, on, on you, you bond with them, you maybe you breastfeed them, they're put in a nursery, they come next to you. I didn't know that it, you could have a baby and they're immediately rushed off into a neonatal ICU to fight for their lives, literally. So this threw me into a completely different world that I was so unaware of. So I am a new mom. Um, I wasn't ready to give birth because I am, baby was premature, I'm at 34 weeks. Uh, my baby has gone into the NICU. I am like as confused as they come. And I'm in this maternity ward in this hospital where everything, you know, things just move in maternity ward. Things just move. You're expected to hire. Sasa tunataka maziwa. Mtoto Like, I was like, what are you talking about? How is the, where is the meal supposed to come? How is it supposed to come out? You know, I was so overwhelmed. I was so confused. I, I think about those days, my first days as a mom, and I still feel chills 
that like I, I wouldn't want to go back to those days because I felt so scared. I felt so ill-equipped. I felt so inadequate as a mother. I felt so helpless. I got to see my son almost a day into having had him because obviously I had also come from uh, a major surgery. I needed to be given time. Baby needed to be given time to be settled in the incubator in the in the NICU. Uh, so by the time a nurse came and said, would you like to see your baby? And I said, of course, I want to see my baby. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what he would look like. I'd, and I remember walking into the, the NICU and he was an, in an incubator. And I just, I, I looked at him and I thought, this is the smallest baby I have ever seen. I mean, he was so small. And then of, of course he had tubes on him and my heart, I, I knew like I fell in love with him instantly, but I was also so scared by what I was looking at because again, the picture was just not the picture you envision when you're anticipating having a baby. I couldn't hold him. Uh, in that moment, I couldn't touch him. I could only look at him through the incubator. And then I now I start to ask questions and I said, how heavy is he? And the nurse told me, Oh, he's um, 1.65 kg. And I thought, that is not, that is like two loaves of bread, like 800 gram bread. <laughs> it's like two loaves of bread. That's how heavy my baby is. Like, why was he so big in my stomach? How, how do you explain that? How is he so small? Hi. And, um, you know, when we, I started being told, okay, Baby, we need to feed the baby. So you need to start um, expressing milk. Um, we need to start lactating, basically. I didn't know where to start. I was so confused. Um, I didn't have a baby to latch on, obviously, because he's premature and they have to conserve his energy. So they don't want to overwork a baby trying to latch onto you. So I had to get a, a breast pump and they're like, you just pump, it will come. Oh my goodness. I remember sitting in the lactation room with other mothers and that first day I was so discouraged because first I was discouraged and there was a level of embarrassment with how little my baby was. I don't know how to explain that because, it, you know, when you when people have a baby, then they send out a text to all their friends. Oh, um, please praise God with us. Baby Nathaniel is here. He's 3.9 or he's 4.2 kg. Those are the messages that usually they come in and we're like, whoa, what a big baby. There's such a, um, uh, it's like a, a medal of honor that you brought forth a, a healthy big baby. And then I was like, how do we draft a message and say, he was 1.65 kilograms. I felt a level of shame. And I remember we drafted the message and we, we said his name, date, time of birth, and we left out his weight. You know, this is a journey of preemie moms that there's just things that we have to grapple with that regular moms don't. And I, I've learned to take, not to take things for granted. So I remember being in the lactation room that day and just feeling like, I don't want to talk. Let nobody ask me how heavy my baby is or how big my baby is. I don't want to have that conversation. So as I'm sitting there, just struggling, pumping nothing, by the way, uh, the moms just start talking. We're making small talk. And one of the moms says, oh, did you just have a baby? Yes, I did a few hours ago, uh, a day ago. Uh, it was, you know, it was a day after. And she says, how heavy was he? And I said, I, I literally whispered, it was like under my breath, 1.65. And she says, sorry? And I said, he was only 1.65. And she's like, oh, that's a big baby. And she's like, mine was 800 grams. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And then the other mom is like, yeah, even me, I had twins. One was 600 grams, the other one was 700 grams. And they're like, you have a big baby. And I thought, oh my gosh. Could, I, could it be that I am a champion in this NICU community of preemie moms? <laughs> that even my 1.65 was big for somebody else. And, um, you know, I just want to encourage you, if you're, uh, you've been a preemie mom and you've been in that place, to encourage you by saying that you've done well, that 
you've been able to bring you've been able to bring forth that baby no matter how little they are 500 grams i've heard of 400 grams and nobody even like i didn't know that after you give birth to a baby when they are born the first few days they lose weight so we dropped from 1.65 to 1.2 kgs and i was so stressed um but I want to say to a preemie mom who's listening to me that I see you, I see you, I, I see your discouragement. I hear you in those levels of shame that you can't quite articulate. I see your struggle. I remember the having to go, you know, being woken up every few hours or uh, getting up every few, few hours, making my way to the NICU. It wasn't very far, but my movement was limited because of the C-section. It was very painful movement, getting there, um, and, 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 and spending time with my child. I remember the, the day that I finally was able to hold him and just feel the warmth of that little baby in my arms. That's where I, I also was taught how to kangaroo a baby. Preemie moms know what I'm talking about. We kangaroo our babies because the skin to skin bonding helps. It, it, it gives them that will to fight you know i'd hold my baby he would literally like fit in in my chest so tiny inside my gown he was hidden completely in my gown and i'd kangaroo him for hours sometimes i'd fall asleep just seated in the NICU i remember this day because you're so fatigued i remember this day telling the nurse I'm falling asleep. I feel like I, I might fall over. And she said, don't worry, we are here. We will we'll make sure that you guys don't fall. They were so kind. I have to say, you know, through my journey in motherhood, I've gone through very cold, cold people um, because for them, it's just a job. Uh, people who will break news without feeling anything like, you know, yeah, there's no heartbeat, there's no whatever. I've experienced that, but I've also experienced very compassionate people. And for me, the most compassionate doctors and nurses that I experienced were in the NICU. Uh, I have to say thank you to each and every one of them for always having a kind word because going in there as a preemie mom, your heart is just, you're, you're, you're so broken in so many ways. And hearing kind words, hearing words of encouragement, feeling the compassion, seeing the genuine care, seeing how they handle your baby. For me, it was everything. It made me feel like, um, okay, it's fine. We're going to be fine. We're going to make make it through this, regardless of what it is. I remember the images of, because the baby is so small and they had, you know, the smallest diapers they could have, but the diaper was like half of his body. Okay, like literally almost up until his neck because he's so small. Uh, but they would take such good care. They would clean our baby so well, wipe them down so well, feed them so well. He was literally feeding from like a tube. And then we graduated to a syringe. Um, I remember when I started lactating and I was like, I, I hardly have any milk. And they said, oh, no, no, no. All we need is five ml because that's how tiny his tummy is. So five ml, you know, they would feed so patiently. Um, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I see your sacrifice. I see the work that you put in. I see your heart for those babies. Thank you. Thank you for loving not just the babies, but loving the mothers and the fathers who come in there to spend time with their children. So, um, you know, having a premature baby is, first of all, is not the end of the world in case you're in that place where you're feeling like it's just a cycle. We don't know if we'll make it through this. We don't know how life will look like for us. I know it. I get it completely. I want to encourage you that there is life beyond being a preemie mom or being a preemie dad, being preemie parents. I want to encourage you and tell you that some of the babies who actually are born premature end up being superseding by milestones, going way ahead of children who are born full term. It happens because they have the will to just fight and to catch up. I remember Nathaniel when later on, when, when we would look at his milestones would go and we were now have, we had a pediatrician and she would look at the graph and Nathaniel was always above the graph, whatever milestones, he was always above the graph. 
And she said, yeah, these preemies, they fight, they fight. And I want to tell you, dear preemie mom or preemie dad, your baby is a fighter. And um, I want to encourage you and just let you know that they, they, will, they will do things that will shock you. They will do things that will amaze you. So as you're in there, in this season, in this moment, I pray for the grace that you need. I pray for a community that will rally around you. If you have somebody who um, has a child who is in the NICU, a child who was born early, I ask you to rally around them. You know, I remember my community coming. Remember, I, st I told you I had not shopped for anything. My community, they showed up. They would come with like, you know, this is your diaper bag. We bought diapers. We bought this. We bought clothes for the baby. They set up my baby room. Uh, my sisters set up my baby's room because I was coming home to no baby's room. I had done nothing. But our community stepped in in such a big way. Um, we got a nanny who knew how to handle uh, a baby who was born early. She was so good. She was so skilled. It gave me confidence because I was scared. I was even scared of washing my baby because I'm like, he's so small. Where am I going to start? Um, Nathaniel stayed in the NICU not too long because he began to put on weight the way he, they needed him to. Um, he was weaned off everything, the oxygen, the, all of those things. And I remember the day that we were told, the doctor actually said, I don't think you need to stay in hospital any longer. You know, it was like music to my ears. Um, I had seen parents who would come all the way. They would commute from Machakos every day, from Rongai every day. They would come to the hospital early in the morning because they need to bring milk for the baby. They would spend time in the hospital the whole day. And, um, you know, this is something I want to say I'm speaking to now to our hospitals, asking, can there be a facilitation for parents who have children in the NICU? Because I would see these parents, thankfully I was still admitted at the hospital. So I had my room, I could still have my meals, but I'd see these parents who ha have been discharged already. The mother has been discharged, the baby's still in the NICU and they'd have to kind of just hang around the hospital the whole day. It was exhausting for them. You could see the fatigue, you could hear it and still having to be there for the babies. Can there be a sort of facilitation for our mothers who have children in the NICU? Can there be even a room for them to just relax where you can take a nap in the daytime, where you can rest? Because I feel like those are moments that really, really challenged my mental health. So putting on the, the fatigue it takes of just every day making that commute. And sometimes I'd wonder, do they have are they getting food to eat? Um, who's looking out for them? It's such a lonely journey. And um, I have such a heart for, for the NICU and for people who go through the NICU because no one, we don't prepare ourselves for it. We don't expect to be, to be there. But the reality is a lot of us will go through that. Uh, we'll have babies, we'll have to go through the NICU. And um, I ended up being a NICU mom twice. I will tell you about... Malachi as we move as we move on with the journey but my journey with Nathaniel really opened my eyes to a world that I didn't know about and I'm grateful oh god I'm so grateful because maybe I would never have been sensitive enough to see the need that there is um, number one to know that women can struggle to get pregnant and sustain it be able to actually have a, a viable pregnancy I didn't know that women can struggle to carry a child and not make it to term. I didn't know that there is such a thing as the NICU and that it's a whole world on its own. I remember our drive leaving the hospital that night when we were discharged. And I had my little, 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 little baby holding him in, in my arm seated in the back seat of that car. And I looked back and saw the hospital. I remember just seeing the emergency side and seeing the lights were on everywhere. And I cried so much. And this, this time there were tears of gratitude because I was leaving the hospital holding a baby who was alive. I didn't know what it was gonna look like. I didn't know if I would know what to do up ahead, but I was like, we have made it this far. And I have learned to take every moment as it comes, to not take anything for granted. So I say the same to you, that nothing is guaranteed. Take it all as it comes. See the blessings and the miracles around you. Um, for all of you who 
watch this channel who never had a struggle, but you're, you're watching and you're saying, Kamboa, thank you for having these conversations because I realize I have taken things for granted. I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being sensitive to your community and to the people around you. And for the women who've had unconventional journeys to motherhood like I have, thank you for being strong. Thank you for staying alive. Thank you for fighting for yourself. Thank you for fighting for your babies and for our community at large. I want to say thank you for being a part of this family of being Kamboa. I appreciate every message that comes in. I read your comments. I see them on YouTube. I am thankful for every guest who gets the courage to sit with me here and share their story that we might be able to pour life into someone else because our experiences, the things we go through, they're not just for us, they're also for you. But as we share, we also heal. As I am sharing, there are parts of me every day that are, that are healing. And I pray that my life will be a lifeline for you. So I am not afraid to make myself vulnerable. I am not afraid to um, speak on hard things because we're not called to do the easy things. We are called to do the things, just the things that God has asked us to do and to do them um, in faith and to do them courageously and to do them boldly. So in case you're new to this family of being Kambua, Karibu Sana, buckle up. The journey is still long up ahead. Later on, we'll bring the gentlemen back in here for a round table because I realized that the men offer us such a perspective on this journey that we wouldn't even see. So men, your voices are so important. We need you. We cannot be parents on our own. We actually need you. So thank you again for being a part of this family. And I look forward to journeying with you.